Chapter One of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter One The Meeting. When the dog came to the weed-grown border of the clearing, he stopped. Then, knowing that his back could be seen over the weeds, he slunk down so that his belly scraped the earth. He was tense and quivering, and his eyes bore a haunted look. But there was nothing craven in them, and little fear. In all his life the dog had never feared anything except the terrible torment that beset him now. He was of no recognizable breed, though all of his ancestors had been large dogs. There was a hint of staghound in his massive head and in his carriage, and somewhere along the way he had acquired a trace of Great Dane. His fur was silky like a collie's, and there was a suggestion of bloodhound in his somewhat flabby jowls. Without purpose or plan, the blood of all these breeds had mingled to produce this big mongrel. He was so emaciated that slatted ribs showed, even through his burr-matted fur. Had he eaten as much as he wanted, he would have weighed about a hundred and ten pounds. But he had had so little food recently that he was fifteen pounds lighter. Intelligence glowed in his eyes, but there was also something in them that verged on desperation. He moved only his head and moved that slowly. This dog knew too much and had suffered too much to let himself be seen until he had some idea of what he was about. He was looking toward a big white farmhouse that was surrounded by a grove of apple trees. A thin plume of blue smoke rose from the chimney, and a pile of freshly split wood lay in the yard. Busy white hens wandered about, white and black cows, and two brown horses chopped grass in a pasture. Pigs grunted in their pen and a black cat sunned himself on the doorstep. The dog's attention returned to the man who was splitting more wood. He was thin, dressed in faded blue jeans and a tan shirt, and blows of his axe echoed dully from the hills surrounding the farmhouse. He worked slowly and methodically. The dog drank eagerly of his scent, although he did not leave his cover, for behind him there was only a trail of torment, abuse, and real danger. He had been wandering for two months, and his path was a long one. But because it was also a twisted one, it had not taken him too far from the place he had left. He had been in villages and towns, through farmlands and forests, and whenever he met men, he had been stoned or clubbed, three times, twice by farmers, and once by a policeman he had been shot at. The dog could not know that this was partly because of his appearance and size. He was big, and he looked wild. Had he cared to do so, he could have killed a man. But what none of his tormentors could know was that, though the dog feared little, he was almost incapable of attacking a human being. What nobody could know either was that most of all the dog was in desperate need of someone to love. Until two months ago, everything had been different. When the dog came to live with Johnny Blazer in the hills behind Smithville, he was so young that it always seemed he must have begun life with Johnny. It was a good life, and he had never wanted any other. Johnny's cabin was big, with the kitchen and combined living dining room on the first floor, and the entire second floor given over to many bunks. It was necessary to have a big cabin, because, in season, Johnny both guided and boarded hunters and fishermen. During the winter, he trapped furs and when there was nothing else to do, he worked at odd jobs, or searched out and sowed medicinal roots, which he found in the hills. A lean, tight-jawed woodsman in his late thirties, Johnny had been the dog's revered master. Because he was a dog, and thus incapable of grasping the more complex facts, the great animal did not understand that life was not the woolly, carefree, and happy one it seemed. He could sense that Johnny avoided the Whitneys, who at various places in the hills lived much as Johnny did, because they were Johnny's enemies, it followed that the Whitneys must be the dog's enemies too. But he never understood what took place. 
Johnny and the dog were strolling towards Smithville when a rifle cracked, and Johnny took three staggering steps to fall forward. While the dog hovered anxiously near, his master tried and failed to get up. The dog knew that the scent of Pete Whitley filled the air, but there was no connection between Pete and the fact that Johnny Blazer lay wounded in the road. For an hour the dog worried beside Johnny, whining because he could not help. Then a car happened along. The two men in it lifted Johnny into the car and were off at high speed. The dog tried to follow, but though he could run very fast, he could not keep up with the car. Out distance, he panted back to the cabin, because he was sure that Johnny would return there, too. He waited a week, never venturing far away and eating only what he could find or catch. Then he set out to look for Johnny. He had gone first to Smithville, and the first person he had met there was Pete Whitney. The dog slowed to a walk, watching Pete warily and bristling. He saw no connection between any of Pete's actions and Johnny's disappearance, but all the Whitneys were enemies. He leaped aside when Pete aimed a swift kick at his groin, then turned with bared fangs. Unarmed, Pete shrank back against a nearby building, and the dog went on. The alarm was sounded. Johnny Blazer's dog had come into town and threatened a person. For a while, Johnny had many friends in Smithville. Nothing was done. But after two days, the dog was considered a menace. Mothers of small children became concerned for their safety. The first act of most men, upon seeing the dog, was to pick up and hurl any convenient missile. The Smithville constable, Bill Ellis, reluctantly set out to kill the animal. But two hours earlier, having satisfied himself that he could not find Johnny in Smithville, the dog had left. What he could not possibly know was that his master was dead, and the official cause of his death was bullet wound inflicted by a person or persons unknown. As the dog wandered, hope faded. He could not find Johnny. But the dog had to have a master because he was unable to live without one. And now, as he lay in the tall weeds, all the deep yearnings in his heart concentrated on this man splitting wood. He half rose, minded to walk out and meet him, but memory of the rocks and clubs that had come his way was not an easy one to banish, and he settled down in the weeds again. Then an uncontrollable longing for someone to love, and someone to love him, overcame everything else, and he left the weeds. He walked, with his tail drooping, in a half circle down his rear. But he was not object, because it was not in him to be so. One or more of his many ancestors had bequeathed to him a great pride and a regal inner sense, and though he would run when a club or brick were hurled at him, he could never cringe. He carried his tail low, because that was the way he had carried it naturally, like a collie or a stag hound. The man, setting a chunk of wood against the splitting block, had his back turned to the dog and did not at once see him. The dog waited, unwilling to intrude until he was invited to do so. The man raised his axe, brought it expertly down, and the wood split cleanly. He stooped to pick up the two pieces, and when he did, he saw the dog. You! Catching up one of the chunks, he hurled it with deadly aim and intent. But even as he did this, the huge animal started to run so that instead of striking him in the head, the chunk of wood struck his right shoulder. The dog felt quick agony that subsided to searing pain as he kept running. Twenty seconds later, he heard a rifle blast, and the thump of a leaden slug that plowed into the earth six inches to one side. The rifle roared a second time, and a third. Then he was safe in the woods. He slowed to a walk, knowing that he could not be seen now, and his nose informed him that there were no other men around. For the time being, he was in no danger, but he was heartsick. Again, he had tried, in every way he knew, to find someone whom he might love, and who in turn might love him. Once more, his overtures had brought him only hurt. The dog could not know that the farmer, seeing him suddenly, had been too startled to think. When he was finally capable of coherent thought, he decided that a wild, dangerous, and doubtless rabid wolf had emerged from the forest, 
and that its only intention could be to prey upon the locality's flocks and herds. Failing to bring it down with his rifle, the farmer got hastily on the phone to mobilize his neighbors. Within half an hour, a posse was out. However, its members were not farmers and not hunters. The only hunting dogs in the area were a few fox and coon hounds and some rapid hounds, and they refused to interest themselves in the supposed wolf's trail. But there was also a pair of big crossbred brindle bulls, and they were urged into the woods. An hour later, the dog met this pair. Coursing a little open glade, they appeared in front of him, and as soon as they saw him, they stopped. The bulls weighed only about fifty pounds each, but they had had many battles, and they knew how to fight. Lifting their lips in anticipatory grins, they closed in. The dog waited, anger rising in his heart. He, too, knew how to fight. For the barest fraction of a minute, he gauged the bull's advance. Then he attacked. He was not as swift as he ordinarily was, because he had not eaten enough. But with his stag hound and collie lineage, he had inherited all the fluid, rippling grace of such dogs. It was not his way to bore in, to seek a hold and keep it, but to slash and slice. He struck the first bull, cut it to the shoulder bone, and leaped clear over his enemy before there could be a return thrush. He twirled to face the second. It came at him with short, choppy gait, eyes half closed and a mouth open as it sought any hold at all. As soon as it was able to get one, it would clamp its jaws and grind until a piece of flesh in its mouth was torn out. Then it would get another hold and another literally tear its enemy apart. The dog waited as though he were about to meet the bull head on. But when only inches separated them, he glided to one side, ducked to get a hold of a front leg, and used all of his strength to throw the bull clear over his head. He turned to meet the second bull that, recovering, had come in to grab his thigh. Twisting himself almost double, the dog slashed and bit, and each time he slashed, fresh blood squirted from the brindle bull's hide. The dog opened his huge mouth, clamped it over the bull's neck, and shook his adversary back and forth. The bulls had courage, but they were crossbreeds and not the fighting bulls that will gladly die if they can take their enemy with them. They staggered twenty feet off and faced the dog warily, as though seeking some new way to attack him. He waited, ready for whatever they might do, and when he finally limped away, he did so with his head turned to see if he was being followed. He was not afraid to renew the battle, but he wanted most to be let alone by this ugly pair. In spite of all the rebuffs and even physical violence that he had met up with, however, he could not abandon the driving urge that had sent him forth. He could not live without a master. Somewhere and somehow he must find one. He passed from settled country into forest where there was only an occasional clearing. When two deer fled before him, he gave half-hearted chase. But his shoulder still hurt, and the battle had wearied him. When the deer outdistanced him, he stopped to eat a few mushrooms that grew on a stump. There were tasteless fare, but they helped still the gnawing in his belly. Near the edge of a pond, he found and ate a fish that had been hurt in battle with a bigger fish, and after that he caught a mouse. Altogether were mere tidbits, and the dog thought wistfully of the delicious meals Johnny Blazer used to prepare for him. Night had fallen when he stopped suddenly his nose tickled by the tantalizing odor of food. Mingled with it was the smell of wood smoke and a man. The dog's nose informed him that there was a creek, and he caught the faintly acid smell of cinders and still that meant a railroad. The dog slowed to a walk and went closer to verify with his eyes what his nose had already told him. There was a creek spanned by a railroad bridge. Beneath the bridge was a small, bright fire over which on a forked stick hung a pot of simmering coffee. Crouched beside the fire was a man, and because there is a difference in the odors of young and old, the dog knew that this was a young man. The dog padded silently through tall, wild grass growing beside the creek. He drooled at the odor of food, but because painful experience had taught him to be very careful in all dealings with men, he did not go any nearer. 
He licked his chops with a moist tongue and excitement danced in his eyes. How he would love to be near that fire, partaking of the food and the caresses of the young man. But he had better be careful. At the same time that the dog met the farmer, who hurled the block of wood at him, Jeff Tarrant was walking down a dusty road that led into the town of Cressman. Two days past his eighteenth birthday, his face betrayed his youth. Healthy as sunshine, he walked with the spring in his step, and his head held high. His rather loose lips formed a grin that seemed permanently fixed. His blue eyes sparkled, and a shock of curly red hair that needed cutting tumbled on his head. Even if it were not for the pack he carried, he would have commanded a second glance. The pack, made of both canvas and leather, and with straps at strategic intervals, was huge. It began at Jeff's hip line, extended two inches over the top of his head, and it was bulging. Across it, in black letters as big as the pack could accommodate, was Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. Jeff himself had designed the pack to fit his needs, and he had done the lettering. It described him perfectly, for what nobody except Jeff knew was that Tarrant Enterprises was limited to whatever might be in the pack. He walked cheerfully, for it was a cheerful day, and he gave thanks for the sparsely settled country and the little traveled road on which he found himself. In the first place, this was the only kind of country in which Tarrant Enterprises LTD could flourish. Secondly, the day was made for walking. When Jeff found himself on traveled roads, he was forever being offered rides, and for the sake of both courtesy and good business he always accepted but there had been no rides today. Descending a hill, Jeff looked down at a junction of two forest valleys, up one of which a train was puffing. He looked at it closely, while the smile in his eyes and that on his mouth seemed to grow a little more pronounced. Railroad tracks meant towns somewhere, and the sort of business Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, could do in towns depended on circumstance. Jeff sniffed deeply, for part of his success depended on an ability to sense what lay ahead. Just as a hunter must sense what is in the offing, now he had wood smoke in his nostrils, and he was not surprised when he rounded an outjutting corner of the hill and saw a farmhouse. Jeff whistled happily as he approached the house and knocked on the front door, and he had the most gracious smile. Tarrant Enterprises LTD could muster up for the woman who opened it. "'Good afternoon, ma'am. I represent Tarrant.' "'Don't want nothing,' she rasped. "'Never buy nothing from peddlers. "'Hard work, loneliness, and collapsed dreams had all left their marks, "'so that she was almost as weather-beaten as the house. "'But Jeff saw at a glance that the place was neat and clean, "'and since she did not close the door, he entered, "'swung the pack from his back, and laid it on a table.' Get it off, she scolded. Don't want no dirty pack on my table. Don't want nothing from no peddler, no how. Jeff sniffled hungrily, a delicious incense. The mingled odors of roast chicken and fresh-baked bread blessed his nostrils. He said slowly and with dignity, I am not a peddler, ma'am. I represent Tarrant. Now look! I just broke my paring knife, and I got no time. Ha ah. ha! Like magic, and seemingly without visible motion, the pack opened. From it, Jeff took a paring knife, with a gleaming blade and a shiny black handle. Only seventeen cents, ma'am. Blade of finest steel and hilt of genuine polished wood. Holds its edges and its temper, too. A lifetime knife. She looked at the knife, longing in her eyes. When she glanced again at Jeff, she was not so hostile. Got no money, she admitted. Jeff laughed. I asked for none. Our conversation became so fascinating that I had no chance to explain that I represent Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. We have long recognized the needs of people such as yourself, people who prefer the refined quiet of country life to crowds and cities. But country life 
as you must know, is not without inconveniences. Our only aim is to bring to the doors of people such as yourself whatever may not be available. Her eyes were suspicious. You mean you're giving me this knife? Not at all, ma'am. Tarrant Enterprises LTD is always willing to barter. Hmm. Is that roast chicken I smell? I ain't trading you no roast chicken for no little knife. Surely one small knife will not fill your needs. Well, I could use some cinnamon sticks. With the same magical ease, Jeff opened his pack and gracefully offered a small parcel of cinnamon sticks. Cinnamon from Ceylon, he said, at the same time wondering if he did not have cinnamon and tea confused. He went on, The world's only pure cinnamon, made available to Tarrant Enterprises LTD through special sources. My, she was impressed. What else do you have? Jeff said in the same tone that a department store manager would have used. What do you wish, ma'am? She eyed the pack. You wouldn't have some real nice gingham? Certainly. Again, it was though the pack opened itself, and from it Jeff took a partial bolt of red-checked gingham. Her eyes softened. It's real pretty. Feel its texture, Jeff urged. Tarrant Enterprises LTD stocks only the best. Shall we say about six yards? She said doubtfully, best make it three. Jeff whipped a pair of scissors from his pack and a folding rule from his pocket. He measured and cut three yards of gingham. She fondled it dreamily and compared to the dress she wore. It was elegance itself. Jeff stood expectantly as though everything in the world were available in his pack. Anything else? She eyed the scissors. Can I have them, too? Jeff frowned slightly. I don't know, ma'am. They sell for a dollar and ten cents, and Tarrant Enterprises LTD must show a reasonable return. Now, she said, as though suddenly remembering, I've got a dollar. And for the rest, might we have bread and chicken? Oh, sure. I'll get it right now. She ran into the kitchen, lingered a few minutes, and returned with a large package, one almost as large, and a small parcel. Jeff smacked his lips. The largest package could contain nothing less than the better part of a roast chicken. The one nearly as large must be a whole loaf of bread, and she pressed all three on him. Some butter for your bread, and here's the dollar. You coming through again? When I do, ma'am, you have an honored place on my list of valued customers. Then you will stop? Most certainly. Be sure now. Ma'am, you have the word of Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. Jeff strolled happily down the road, and he had cheated his customer in no way. Tarrant Enterprises was always ready to barter, for Jeff had long since learned that money must be spent. Now he had a mill as good as any the best inn served and he had it for half of what he would have paid in cash. But the woman was happy, too, and that always made for a fair deal. When he came to where the two valleys made one, Jeff left the road and sought the railroad tracks. Last night he had slept in a haystack, but it was far from an ideal bed. Jeff had not resented the mice, for he thought mice were interesting. The hay itself had been old, filled with seeds and thristle, and tonight he wanted a better camp. It was always possible to find one along a railroad. As it always did when he sighted potential customers, Jeff's interest quickened when he saw two men with a hand car beside them working on the tracks. He came abreast of them, two sweating, bewhiskered men who, even on this bright day, managed to look sullen. Good afternoon, gentlemen. They glared at him from beneath bushy eyebrows and looked meaningly at each other. Beat it, peddler. Jeff laughed merrily. What a refreshing sense of humor. Such an intelligent bit of wisdom. You are just the men I hope to meet. I represent Tarrant. Beat it, peddler. Now just think about that. Reconsider if... The two raised threatening pickaxes. Are you diff? I was just going, Jeff said hastily. He was not so much as a trifle saddened as he trudged on down the tracks. 
Even Terran Enterprises LTD could not overcome cells resistance that was backed by threatening pickaxes, and nobody won every time. Nobody had to, for just down the road there were sure to be new customers. Jeff came to a still railroad bridge and looked with delighted eyes at the creek flowing beneath it. It was a clear spring-fed stream, and it purled down riffles that filled a deep pool. Beneath the bridge there were weeds, sand, and some big rocks and driftwood. Scrambling down the embankment, Jeff sighed at the sheer luxury of such a place. It had everything anybody needed. Carefully he laid the pack down, put his food parcels in the shade, and from his own personal compartment of the pack he took a towel, a washcloth, and a bar of soap, a toothbrush, and a comb. Taking off his clothes, he plunged into the pool and swam across. After five minutes, he waded out, soaped himself from head to toe, and rinsed in the pool. He was thus engaged when the hand car rattled over the bridge. Jeff dried himself, dressed, and combed some order into the chaos of his hair. For a while, he was satisfied to lay in the sun, happy just to dream. Left without parents when a young child, he had been brought up in an orphanage, which he had voluntarily left when he was fourteen and a half. He had worked for a farmer, for a livery stable, which was in the process of becoming converted to a garage, for a pipeline crew, and for others, long enough to convince himself that there is no special virtue in, and not much to be gained through hard work alone. For the past two and a half years, he had been owner, manager, and entire working force, of Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. That, by train, car, horse, conveyance, and on foot, had taken him to both coasts and both borders. He spent his summers in the north and his winters in the south, and the tidy roll of bills sewed in an inside pocket was proof that hard work is fine and wonderful if combined with initiative and intelligence. It was a happy life, one he liked, and though he thought he might take root some time, he was not ready to do it yet. Not until dusk brought the first hint of evening chill did Jeff gather wood and build a fire. He built it close enough to a big boulder so that the rock surface would reflect heat, but far enough away so that it would not be too hot. He lingered beside the pool, listening to the night noises. Out in the forest a whippoorwill began its eerie cry, and a sleepy bird twittered from its roost. The purling riffles splashed and called, and a breeze set the forest to sighing. Only a stone rolling down the embankment seemed to be out of tune. Jeff's fire cast weird shadows, and the snapping of a burning wood added its own notes to the symphony of night. Jeff turned from the stream toward his fire and confronted the two men whom he had met along the railroad. Now he knew why that stone had rolled. Except for this one small sound, they had come silently, and in the firelight they seemed even more unkept than they had appeared in the full light of day. They were big men, all muscle, and they carried pick handles in their brawny fist. Jeff felt a cold chill ripple down his spine, for it looked as though the least Tarrant Enterprises LTD was about to lose was its entire capital stock. He tried to take command of the situation. Good evening, gentlemen. I thought you'd be back. I was sure you are an intelligent, one of the men said, taking Buff. The two parted to come at Jeff from both sides. He looked longingly at a club lying near the fire, and as though he had read Jeff's mind, the man called Buff stood on the club. Jeff backed slowly toward the water. He might lose the pack but he intended to keep his money, and he had no intention of letting anyone work him over with the pick handle. As he retreated, he felt with his feet for rocks, clubs, anything at all, with which to fight back. The two men advanced slowly, and Jeff risked a backward glance to see himself within three paces of the water. There was only sand beneath his feet. At exactly that moment, the dog appeared. He came slowly, with dignity, but uncertainty, because he was not sure of a welcome. Neither was he able to restrain himself any longer. For more than half an hour he had hidden in the grass, studying 
and entranced by Jeff. Now he had to find out whether he was acceptable. He halted four feet away, not caring to go any closer until he was sure. Seeing him, Jeff saw his own salvation. He snapped his fingers and said, Well, where have you been keeping yourself? The dog sighed ecstatically. For so very long he had sought someone, and now at last he had found him. He came forward to brush his shaggy back against Jeff's thighs, and he looked up at the two men. Huge, a wild and salvage appearing thing, even in the full light of the day, he was even more so by the fire's dancing glow. His eyes sparkled. His pendulous jaws seemed taut and strained, and though he regarded the two men with suspicion only, neither could know that. They backed. Jeff patted the big dog's head and said amiably, Just my dog, just my little old dog. I need some help while I attend to the far-flung business of Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. His tone became slightly reproachful, and he said to the dog, Here, here, don't bite them now. The two men scrambled up the embankment and disappeared. End of chapter one. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Chapter two of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter two. Bad Luck. Where it flowed into the pool beneath the bridge, the creek made rippling little noises. A swimming muskrat going upstream and suddenly seeing the fire and the two beside it splashed as he dived. From somewhere up the forested hills there floated an owl's mournful cry. Over all murmured a caressing little breeze which, while still soft with summer's gentleness, had within it a foretaste of autumn's cold. Shaken, Jeff stood a moment. It was not the first time anyone had tried to strong-arm his pack away from him, but it was the closest anyone had ever come to succeeding. His fright ebbed away. Tarrant Enterprises LTD had led him into other unusual situations, and doubtless would lead into more. He turned to the dog. Welcome, pal, he said grandly. From now till forever you may share the fortunes of Tarrant Enterprises LTD. But what the dickens sent you at exactly the right time? The dog quivered with delight. He had wandered for so long, his only aim to find someone who would be glad of his company, and at last his goal was reached. He wagged a happy tail and licked Jeff's hand with the tip of a moist, warm tongue. Though he would never cringe, the dog could appease, and now that he had found someone, in order to stay near, he would appease any way he could. Jeff's exploring hand found the dog's matted head and ears, and a puzzled frown wrinkled his forehead. Whoever you belong to hasn't been taking very good care of you, he murmured. Haven't you ever been brushed? His hands dropped farther to the dog's side, and when he touched the right front shoulder, the great animal whined and brought his head quickly around. Jeff had found the place which the chunk of wood had struck, and that was painful. But the dog did not bare his teeth or growl. Jeff took his hands away. You've been hurt, pal, he said understandably. Here, let me feel it once more. Very gently, pressing no harder than was necessary, he went over the right shoulder again. He could feel no broken bones, but just beneath the skin was a jelly-like mass of congealed blood and when Jeff brought his hand away, his fingers were sticky with blood. Next he found the wound inflicted by the brindle bull, and he continued to explore his puzzlement increased. The dog wore a round leather collar that formerly might have fitted well, but because he was thin, it now hung loosely. There was no license or identifying tag. 
Starved to gauntness, obviously the animal had been receiving neither food nor attention. His long fur was matted, and there were so many burrs of various kinds entangled in it that there was almost no hope of grooming him properly. The conviction grew upon Jeff that this dog was astray, and that he had come to the fire because there was no other place for him. Either he had lost his master, or his master had lost him, and in either event he was homeless. Jeff frowned. The whole success of Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, hinged on its being entirely footloose. There were places to go, and often it was essential to go there in somewhat of a hurry. Obviously, it would be impossible to take a dog this size on a train, and certainly nobody with any sort of vehicle would be inclined to pick him up. Jeff said good-humoredly, Why the dickens couldn't you have been one of those flea-sized dogs that I might have tucked in my pocket? The dog wagged his tail and looked at this friendly human with happy eyes. Jeff rubbed his huge head and tried to think of a way out of his dilemma. Surely the big fellow had no home and was loose on the countryside. Familiar with stray dogs, Jeff knew that just one fate awaited them. Sooner or later, but surely, they were killed. Ordinarily, the young trader would have confined himself to pity, but this dog had helped him when he was in desperate need of help. He must not be abandoned now. Perhaps, Jeff thought, he could find a family that would give the dog a home. But he abandoned the notion almost as soon as it glimmered. How many families wanted a dog half the size of a Shetland pony? Maybe he could pay someone to take care of him. But how could he be sure that the dog would be cared for and not abused? There was no way to check. Six weeks from now, depending on where Tarrant Enterprises LTD led him, Jeff might be a hundred or a thousand miles away. He did not know when, if ever, he would come back. The happy thought that first things must be first occurred to him. While the dog looked gravely on, he tilted his bubbling coffee away from the fire and unwrapped the chicken. The dog licked his lips and riveted his gaze on the fowl. Jeff grinned. He had been told that dogs should not have chicken bones, but unless they were always tied or pinned, sooner or later most dogs found and ate them. At any rate, the dog had to eat, and there wasn't anything except chicken, bread, and butter. Jeff sliced both legs from the chicken and ordered, Sit. The dog sat. Obviously, he had had training. When Jeff extended a chicken leg, the dog took it from him so gently that only his lips touched Jeff's hand. But when he had the leg in his mouth, he tore all the meat from it with one turn of his jaws. Then he ground the bone to bits and swallowed that too. Jeff looked at the two bites he had taken from his own drumstick. Hey, he protested, just because you're company, you don't have to gobble everything in sight. He looked determinedly away and took another bite of chicken, but he felt the dog's appealing eyes on him and turned back again. If you could talk, he said resignedly, you could be sales manager for Tarrant Enterprises LTD. You certainly know how to sell yourself. Jeff cut a wing, gave it to the dog, and watched in fascination while it went the way of, and as fast as, the chicken leg. He cut the loaf of bread into six thick slices, spread an equal amount of butter on each, and saw the dog gulp five of them. Jeff ate as rapidly as he could. If he was going to get anything, he had to get it fast. He watched while the dog ate all the rest of the chicken and cleaned and swallowed the splintered bones. If you're going to be a partner, he observed, you'd better learn to pay your own way. I'll go broke, just feeding you. Oh, well, we can always have a nice fresh air for breakfast. Now, I'm going to work on you, pal. You do look sort of wild and woolly, and it might help both of us stay out of trouble if you didn't. Down. The dog lay down, eyes glowing happily, and Jeff used gentle fingers to untangle his fur. Where it was matted too tightly, he cut it off with a pair of scissors separating a hair at a time, and using as little pressure as possible, he worked on the injured right side. Then he took a brush from his pack and brushed the dog smooth. When he was finished, the dog still looked huge. His eyes sparkled in the firelight, and his flappy jaws loaned him an air of grimness. But his coat was no longer tangled or burr-matted. He looked forbidding enough so that it was easy to understand why the two track workers, 
seeing him and thinking he was Jeff's, had decided to run. Even though they were armed with pick handles, anyone at all might well hesitate to make rash moves around this mammoth creature. Now we have to get wood, pal, Jeff told his new friend. The nights in mountain country are apt to be on the cool side. He cast around for driftwood that the creek had thrown onto its banks, and when he had an armful, he dumped it near the fire. Always the dog padded beside or behind him, as though fearful he would lose this kind master should he wander more than a foot from him. Jeff threw some wood on the fire, and a shower of sparks floated into the air. The dog curled contently near where he lay down with his back against the boulder. Jeff awakened at periodic intervals to throw more wood on the fire, and in the misty gray of early morning he was aroused by the unmistakable sound of a freight train making up. He listened intently. It paid to understand freight trains. He hadn't known how far off Cressman was, but he knew now. Judging by the sound of the freight train, the railroad yards must be in Cressman. It was about one mile or twenty minutes walk away. Without getting up, the dog bared his gleaming flanks in a cavernous yawn. He rose, stretched, came to Jeff for a morning caress, and drank from the creek. Jeff looked admirably at him. The dog was one of the biggest he'd ever seen, but he moved with all the grace of a much smaller animal. Jeff dipped water, prodded his fire, and put fresh coffee on to brew. The dog looked expectantly at him. You ate it all last night, Jeff explained. There isn't a thing left unless maybe you like coffee. The dog sniffed about to look up splinters of bone, and Jeff looked at his big pocket watch. He lay back against the boulder, pillowing his head on his hands, and blinked into the rising sun. Quarter to six, he told his companion, and we have to time our arrival in this monopolis almost to the minute. Time waits for no man, but we'll wait for time. The freight labored toward them, rumbled over the bridge, and sent a shower of dust and center particles down. Sitting a little ways from the fire, the dog did not even look up. Jeff poured a cup of black coffee, sipped it, and the dog licked his chops. He was not as hungry as he had been, for last night's meal was a satisfying one. But he had been so long without food that he would have eaten had there been anything to eat. Jeff still lolled idly against the boulder. Dogs were welcome in some towns, and unwelcome in others, and Jeff had never been to Cressman, but it was a country seat. There was sure to be a courthouse, and courthouses opened at nine sharp. Jeff wanted to be there at that time, but not before. If the dog had a license, even though some might protest his presence, they could do nothing about it as long as he was accompanied by Jeff. Finishing his coffee, Jeff poured another cupful, drank it, and dozed for a while. Though he had had a long rest, it was well to sleep while he could. Often, Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, walked into a situation where there was no possibility of any rest. At exactly twenty minutes to nine, with the dog beside him, Jeff started down the tracks. Cressman, he saw, when he entered its outskirts, was a good-sized town and typical. Neat white houses framed both sides of the street. The business section would be farther on, and naturally the large building, with the flagpole on top, would be the courthouse. Jeff walked swiftly, paying no attention to the stairs directed at him. He had expected the dog to arouse notice. The clock over its entrance pointed to nine when he reached the courthouse. The dog close beside him, Jeff entered and turned down a corridor where a white-lettered black sign indicated that license might be had. He paused beside a grilled window, behind which was draped a lank, black-haired, heavy-eyed, middle-aged clerk, who looked as though he had never been fully awake. Without glancing around, the clerk asked a weary, Yes. I want a license. What kind? What kinds do you have? Hunting, fishing, marriage, building, auto, dog, store, cafe, a wide enough choice. I want a dog license. Jeff took the yellow form and the pencil that was offered to him and started to write. He turned the pencil sideways and pressed it until the lead broke. Jeff handed it back. This is no good. I'll use one of my own. His hand stole into the pack and brought forth the mechanical pencil. 
Not looking at the clerk, Jeff gave absorbed attention to the yellow form. Under sex, he wrote, Mel. When he came to age, he looked shrewdly at the dog and penciled in. Three years. Breed proved difficult, but not for very long. Sure that nobody else would know it either, Jeff wrote, Algerian Borham. Name was simple. Happily, Jeff wrote, pal, and shoved the slip back through the grill. The clerk was staring intently at the pencil. Where'd you get that? This? Jeff held the pencil up. It's a bagstone, the newest thing. I wouldn't be without one. Want to sell it? Uh huh. I have only a couple left, and I may need them. What's it cost? A dollar. License is fifty cents. Can we swap? Jeff passed the pencil through the grill, but instead of the expected fifty cents, the clerk handed him another slip of paper. What's this? Peddler's license, and you're a peddler. They cost fifty cents, so we're even. Jeff, who had thought the clerk a naive rustic, grinned his appreciation of someone else who knew how to get what he wanted, and started down the corridor. He was still cheerful. He had bought a dozen of the pencils for two dollars, and all except two were sold. It was a good sign, and he might do a brisk business in Cressman. He hadn't thought so when he came in because there were so many stores, and usually people would not buy from a peddler if they could get what they wanted at a store. But Jeff felt lucky. Coming in, he'd been in too much of a hurry to reach the courthouse to pay much attention to the town. Now he had an opportunity to examine it closely. Between 2,500 and 3,000 people, he guessed, lived in Cressman. They were supported by the railroad yards and by a sawmill whose screeching saw made a hideous noise on that end of town, which Jeff had not yet visited. And the workers must be well paid because there was every evidence of prosperity. The wooden sidewalks were well cared for. The dirt streets were clean, and the horses on the street were good animals that cost a fair amount of money. And there were a few autos with brass-fronted radiators. These were all good signs. The fact that the store seemed well patronized was bad, but Jeff wouldn't be able to tell until he had done some canvassing of his own, and he wanted to do that before getting breakfast for Pal and himself. Trade ran in cycles. If one Cressmanite was quarreling with the storekeepers, the chances were good that the person's friends would be similarly disposed to take an unkind view of merchants. If there were several such quarrels, Jeff might do a thriving business. The young trader took an obtrusive stand beside a store whose sign read, John T. Allen, General Merchandise. Beneath that, in smaller letters, was, The best of everything for everyone at the lowest prices. Pal sat down as close as he could get and touched Jeff's dangling hand with a cold nose. There were few people on the street, but that was to be expected at this hour. The workers would be working, the housewives taking care of their houses, and the children playing. Jeff's eyes roved down the main street. He located and filed away in his mind the doctor's office, the dentist, the stores, the blacksmith's shop, the livery stable, and other business establishments. He knew where the sawmill was, and he saw two church steeples. With few exceptions, all the rest would be homes. It was a good, substantial town, one of many such that Jeff had visited. He looked with mingled wistfulness and amusement at a boy prodding down the sidewalk toward him. About eight years old, the youngster wore a faded shirt, torn pants, and had a dirty face that was lighted by bright eyes and a grin. He shuffled along, being careful to step only on the cracks in the sidewalk and kicking at small objects in his path. Then he saw the dog, his head went up, his grin became a smile, and he hurried to pause in front of Jeff and Pal. Gee, he breathed, is he ever big? What's his name? Pal, Jeff answered. Do you like big dogs, son? I like all dogs. Does he bite? Gentle as a kitten. Go ahead and pet him. Pal stood, his head reaching almost to the youngster's shoulders, and wagged a welcoming tail at the hand stretched toward him. The boy tickled Pal's ears and smoothed his muzzle. Wish he was mine, he sighed. Don't you have a dog? 
My paw, the boy said mournfully, won't let me have one. Well, I got to go down to Skinner's and get Ma some sugar. Take this. Jeff drew a peppermint stick from his pack and extended it. The boy took it with the same hand he had used to pet Pal and grinned his thanks. Jeff watched him skip down the street and sighed. He liked everybody, but he had an especially soft spot in his heart for children. Besides, it was good business. Should he decide to make a house-to-house -house canvasser, he had already paved the way in at least one home. Two women passed, going to the far side of the walk and keeping their eyes averted when they reached Jeff, and a man came from the opposite direction. Without seeming to, Jeff studied him. About thirty, the man was slim and subtle, snapping black eyes and a pert waxed mustache betraying his French origin and his quick, sure steps he was a woodsman. He swerved into John T. Allen's door, and Jeff decided that he was a man of short temper. A moment later, that opinion was borne out. Sacré, came an outraged roar. You are a dog among dogs, a pig among pigs. You cheat the honest people. There came a snappish but calmer voice. Take it easy, Pierre. Never, Pierre shouted, never, and never do I come back. He bristled out of the store, turned to fling a final, never, pig, back into it and confronted Jeff. You know what he do, he screamed. I need the knife, the good hunting knife, for he wants a dollar and twenty-five cents. Maybe they're worth that much. None. Never, he looked seriously at Jeff. You sell the hunting knife? I do not compete with merchants. You sell the hunting knife, Pierre repeated. I sell me the hunting knife. But this I demand, sell me the hunting knife. With every show of reluctance, Jeff drew a hunting knife with the three-inch blade from his pack. Pierre snatched it, and his eyes lighted deliriously. How much? A dollar and twenty cents. Is good? Pierre pressed a rumbled dollar bill and two dimes into Jeff's hand, danced back to the store entrance, and waved the knife as though he were about to go scalping with it. See? he screamed at the storekeeper. Dog! See? The peddler, he do better than you. I have the hunting knife. Pierre stamped fiercely away, and Jeff settled back to watch, but only for a moment. The man who came out of the store was no more than five feet three and so thin that he seemed in imminent danger of collapsing. His nose, covering a fair share of his face, was oddly like a rudder. A few strands of blonde hair clung precariously to his head, and his eyes were furious. Did you sell that man a knife? Yes, I did. Without further ceremony, but with a roar that seemed incapable of emerging from one so small, the storekeeper bellowed, Joe! It was a signal Jeff had heard many times, in many voices that expressed it in many ways. This was one of the occasions when Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, had better move fast. The dog fell in beside him as Jeff started to run. He was too late, though. It was as though the storekeeper possessed some magical quality that would conquer up images at will. Jeff's path was suddenly blocked by a burly 210-pound man who wore a gun, a constable bull's badge, an air of authority, and who had never wasted any time acquiring fat. He loomed over Jeff as a mountain looms over a knoll. What's up? he demanded. This peddler, the storekeeper reverted to his customary snappish voice, is interfering with merchants. He sold Pierre Lelurk a honey knife. Did you? the constable asked Jeff. Yes, but I have a license. It's not one that allows you to peddle in business districts, the shopkeeper asserted. Jail him, Joe. You come in peaceable? the constable asked, or should I take you? Peaceable. Jeff answered hurriedly, always peaceable. Come on, then. Your dog got a license? Look for yourself. Just sort of watch your hand. That dog bite? Not usually. See that he don't, huh? I'll see, Jeff promised. He fell resignedly in beside the constable while Pal paced behind him. He thought ruefully of how little a feeling of good fortune could be trusted. 
Still, by no means would this be the first jail to have him as a guest, and probably it would not be the last. He might as well make the best of it. Nice town you have here, he said, companionably. Yeah, the constable was entirely willing to be friendly. It's all right. How long have you been chief of police in Cressman? Nine years. Say, that's a good title. Chief of police, huh? You should call yourself that, Jeff asserted. Do you have much trouble? The constable shrugged. It depends. There's just one thing I wonder about, Jeff said. I've met a lot of police in a lot of towns. All the rest had silver badges. How come yours is brass? It was silver when I got it, the constable said ruefully. Blame thing turned color on me. Why don't you polish it? I do. Every night, you soap and all. Can't do a thing with it. Have you tried Blecker's silver polish? What's that? A polish for badges. Never heard of it. Some store in Cressman should stock it. They don't. I've tried everything they have. He looked searchingly at Jeff. Do you have any? Yes, but Jeff laughed nervously. You've already got me on one charge. I wouldn't care to be up on two. Let me see it, the constable urged. I better not. I won't tell a person. And you have the word of Joe Parker for that. Come on, let's sneak behind this fence and have a look. Well, in the shadow of the fence, Jeff took a jar of Blecker's unique silver polish from his pack, dipped an end of his handkerchief lightly into it, and carefully rubbed a small portion of the badge. As though by magic, the tarnish disappeared and bright silver gleamed where it had been. How much does that cost? The constable breathed. Thirty cents a jar, but you've treated me so nicely. I'll let you have two for fifty cents. Thanks. The constable slipped the two jars in his trousers pocket, gave Jeff a half dollar and said, Guess we'd better get you to jail. Guess we had. The constable steered Jeff and Pal back to the courthouse but took them into the basement instead of the main entrance. There were two windows with a desk beneath them, and behind the desk sat a gray-haired man with a friendly face but a weary smile. In the dimly lighted corridor beyond were four jail cells. The constable paused at the desk. Hi, Pop, he greeted the jailer. This peddler was peddling near stores. You tell him what to do with his dog and pack, huh? Without another glance at Jeff, Joe Parker turned and started back toward the entrance. Even as he walked, he industriously polished his badge. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas Chapter 3 of Trading Jeff and His Dog this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kelgard. Chapter 3 Escape The jailer tilted his chair, clamped both hands behind his head, and looked steadily at the new arrival. Jeff stood still, sensing something here that had not been evident at first glance. Pop had a kindly face and a weary smile, but were they a mask? After a moment he spoke. What are you doing here, boy? Getting in jail? You're a peddler? I represent Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. Now I have here, whoa, whoa there, I see a lot of peddlers. My knife is all right. My watch is all right. I don't need toothpicks, toothbrushes, or anything else, and I haven't any family. How long have you been peddling? Quite a spell. You ever been in trouble before? Jeff said blandly, I've been in jail before. You're just a kid, and I don't like to see kids in trouble, the jailer murmured sadly. How much trouble am I in? You'll be kept till you can be brought before Justice Murphy. He'll fine you five dollars and tell you to get out of town. Can't I see him now? Justice Murphy, Jeller said, has gone fishing. He won't be back for a week. Then I'm to be your guest for a week. Looks that way. 
Might as well get you checked in. He took a pad of forms from the desk and balanced a pencil. In the proper places, he inscribed Jeff's name, age, the offense with which he was charged, and other pertinent data. He looked closely at what he had written, and from the dark cells in the back came a shouted, Hey, Pop, who's the new tenant? Shut up, Ike. I'll bring him back, Pop. Buck in me'd like to meet him. You two be quiet, Pop reprimanded the prisoner. Then he addressed Jeff. Ike Wilson and Bucky Edwards. They finally got caught. What for? Stealing chickens? Jeff looked unbelieving, and the jailer's face became less gentle. For a moment he was almost stern. That's serious. It isn't a light matter, I know. Now why did you look so doubtful? It seems a few chickens are hardly worth a jail sentence. They're not, and neither is anything else. But some people have never learned that. It just happens those boys aren't satisfied with one chicken. They got 3,000 that anybody knows about. Who? They'll pay for it. Now, Jeff, I'll have to take your dog. Jeff sparred for time. He had known other people in similar circumstances whose dog had been taken away and half the time they'd simply disappeared. That they'd sickened and died was the usual story, but actually they'd been destroyed because it was too much trouble to take care of them. Outwardly, Jeff affected an air of supreme indifference. Sure, he agreed. Go ahead. Just be careful. Pal doesn't like a lot of people, and he bites whoever he dislikes. Better be careful he gets his regular feed in every day, too. That's four pounds of the best chuck steak. He hates everybody if he doesn't get it. Yeah? Pop was not at all friendly now. Suppose he gets sick. If I don't get him back, and in as good a shape as when he was taken away, I know a couple of good lawyers. Lawyers cost money. I have a certain amount of influence. Pop rubbed his chin reflectively and stared at the window. I suppose you could keep him in your cell if you wanted to pay for his board. I might, Jeff said, knowing he had won this round and that his chance shot had hit the bull's eye. Obviously, for reasons of his own, Pop did not care to have any lawyers investigating anything. How good a cell? Pop was all brittle now. If you've been in other cells, you know how good. How old are you? Old enough to land in jail. That tie you're wearing, Pop, it hardly befits the dignity of your position in. I told you not to try to sell anything to me. Maybe, just maybe, we can think up some other charge. We'd buy if we had any money, the man in the back cell yelled. What's your name, peddler? Jeff Tarrant, representing Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. The most quality for the most discriminating people. What's that dis dingus mean? It means shut up, Pop snarled. You're a smart one, huh? Jeff said meekly. All I know is black from white. I take my pack in the cell too, don't I? No. I know exactly what's in it, Jeff warned. And I know just what to do if even a penny's worth is missing. Maybe I know what to do if nothing's missing. We can get tough too. I want that pack. All right, keep it and come on. Pal stayed very close to Jeff as Pop led them toward the cells. The two chicken thieves came to the front of theirs and clasped the bars with their hands. They were woolly delighted because, in his brush with Jeff, Pop had come off second best. Jeff grinned back at them. Hey, Jeff, got anything to make our happy home happier? Tarrant Enterprises LTD has something for everyone and can please you. Here is a nice hacksaw. I'll take that, Pop said. You'll take it for 39 cents. Hand it over. You'll get it back when you leave. Well, Jeff gave him the hacksaw, and the pair in the adjoining cell roared with laughter. Pop asked, got any more? Unfortunately, the hacksaw department is understocked, and our new order has not arrived. Get in. Pop unlocked a cell, and Jeff and Pal entered. The bars were in front only. The cells were separated by brick walls. Adjusting his eyes to the gloomy interior, Jeff saw two bunks with dirty mattresses suspended by chains that were attached to the wall. There was an iron stand upon which stood a chipped basin and a faded towel. Beneath the stand was a bucket. Pop slammed the door. 
I sleep in front, he advised. I've got a sawed-off shotgun, and I know how to use it. Besides, just trying to break out can mean six months in prison. Think it over. Sure, Jeff smiled. Pop strolled back to the desk while the two chicken thieves shouted raunchous insults. Jeff lost himself in thought. The situation had been quite obvious from the moment he entered the jail. A few towns had a full-time jailer for two or three prisoners, unless there were other factors involved. And almost without exception, such factors existed only when there were certain affairs that would not bear close examination. The majority of Cressman's citizens probably were honest, hard-working people, but some of its officials were not. The fact that they could be dishonest only because the rest were indifferent to the way their town's affairs were conducted did not change the situation. If he were one of the inside clique, Pop would have a better job, but he evidently knew enough so that he had to be given something in order to prevent his talking. Pop's reaction, when Jeff expressed such utter willingness to take the matter up with an attorney, offered additional proof of this. Jeff let his hand fondle Pal's head as he considered his chances. There was little possibility of breaking out by force, and it would not be a good idea to do so anyway. As things stood, he faced a minor charge. Breaking jail was a major one. It was illegal to keep him confined for seven days without benefit of counsel, but that could be brushed over. They could always claim that it, they held him on suspicion of some other serious charge. Jeff sighed. He held a club over Cressman. The Cressman held him in jail. He scratched Pal's ears and murmured, Never, never be said that Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, gave away to despair. What'd you say, Jeff? I called. Comfortable home, Jeff answered gaily. Counter the cockroaches in your private suite? Not yet. We got 47, I said proudly. One night as big as that dog of yours. What you got in your pack? Candles, Jeff suggested. Law, if Buck and me had any money, we'd buy some. Jeff took three candles, which he bought for a penny and sold for three cents each from his pocket. He handed two of them and a half dozen matches around the end of his cell. A gift from Tarrant Enterprises, LTD. Thanks, Tarrant, what you call it? We'll pay you as soon as we've found us a fortune. I'll count on it, Jeff said. He lighted the third candle dripped wax from it onto the iron stand and set it upright in its own drippings. By its flickering light, he examined the cell more closely. It was what he had expected. The floor was dirty, the mattresses only a little less so, and cockroaches scurried for cracks. Jeff let his hand brush Pal's head again. Completely trusting, the dog wagged his tail and shoved his nose against his master's thigh. Dragging the mattress from the top bunk, Jeff laid it on the floor. Conceivably, even a dog would, could protest against sleeping up there. Hunger reminded Jeff that neither he nor Pal had eaten anything since last night. And again he took refuge in the happy thought that first things must be first. He edged up to the bars and said softly, Ike? Yeah. Where's the food come from around here? The garbage can, Ike answered sadly. Anyhow, that's what I think. Can we get any other? If you got money, you can ask Pop. Nothing like trying, Jeff raised his voice. Hey, Pop, what do you want? How about something to eat? It's not lunchtime. How about some anyhow? Got any money? Jeff replied mournfully. A few pennies I've been saving for my old age. I can pay for it. Pop came to the cell. What do you want? Three loaves of bread and three half pounds of cheese. Let's have the money. Uh-huh. Bring it first. Show me the money. Jeff held up two crumbled dollar bills. Pop walked to the entrance, and there came the click of his key turning in the lock. Breathless silence reigned. This was a momentous occasion that must be properly observed. Ten minutes later, the key clicked again, and Pop came in with parcels. Three loaves of bread, he read from a slip, 18 cents. A pound and a half of cheese, 30 cents. And, he looked maliciously at Jeff, four pounds of the best ground steak for the dog, one dollar. Jeff grinned. His own words had backfired on him. He had intended to give Pal a loaf of bread and a half pound of cheese to offer the same to those in the next cell, 
and to keep as much for himself. But he did not lose his aplomb. Exactly, he exclaimed, just what I wanted. But I wouldn't think of paying in money when I can offer something of great value. Now, give me the money, Pop growled, a dollar and forty-eight cents. Oh, well, if you must be crass, Jeff gave him a dollar and forty-eight cents in change. Give my pals in the next cell a loaf of bread and a pound of cheese. Thanks, Ike said feelingly, and even the silent Bucky mumbled his gratitude. Jeff laid his pack on the lower bunk, put his food on the pack, and made two sandwiches with the half pound of raw ground steak between each. He spread a paper, scooped two pounds of steak upon it, and gave it to Pal. The rest of the steak he passed into the next cell. This, Ike exclaimed, is as good as a hotel. Best grub I ever threw a lip over. Jeff, if ever you want a helping hand, you can count on me and Bucky. I'll remember, Jeff promised. He ate his two sandwiches while Pal licked thoroughly the paper in which the steak had been wrapped. Then he looked up appealingly, and Jeff threw him a quarter loaf of bread. The rest of the food he put in his pack. He heard Ike whispered, Jeff? Jeff went to the front of the cell. Yes? You want to get out of here? I'll make like I'm sick. When that old fool comes in, Bucky and me will grab him and get his keys. We'll give them to you and you can beat it. What about you? Ha! Huh, Ike scoffed. They can't do much more to us than they've already gone to do. Thanks just the same, but we'd better not. You like this hole? No, but there must be a better way. There's none quicker. I know. Thanks anyway. Why don't you two get out? We don't dash, Ike mourned. How do we know when we got Bill Willer's chickens that Bill would call his seven brothers in? They's a-settling around the town, just waiting for me and Bucky to break loose, and every one of them with a rifle. When Bucky and me go out of Cressman, we got to go with officers. Jeff chuckled. Too bad, Ike, but I don't want to break jail. The day wore on. Grown accustomed to the candlelight, the cockroaches came out of their cracks and scurried across the floor. This proved vastly intriguing to Pal, who watched them interestingly. He made quick little rushes, but the cockroaches always escaped. Jeff walked restlessly around the small cell. There had to be a way out, because there was a way out of everything, but he could think of nothing. Suddenly inspired, he called, Pop? What? I, I just wanted to see if you were still there. Of course I'm here. Jeff, who had intended to hold a five-dollar bill against the cell bars and indicate that it would be Pops in exchange for freedom, abandoned the plan almost as soon as he conceived it because it was hardly consistent with the business politics of Tarrant Enterprises LTD or with its standards. He must pay for nothing if he could trade, and there had to be something he could trade for release. Bucky said fretfully, Jeff, what do you want? Got anything in that pack of yours that'll help pass time? How about some music? Anything. Jeff took from his pocket a small mouth organ with which he often beguiled the hours. He was happy again, and his smile glowed once more. He'd been thinking too hard. If he relaxed with the mouth organ for a little while and cleared his mind, he would get some new ideas. By way of tuning up, he blew a soft note, and the cell erupted. Pal, who had been lying quietly on the mattress, leaped to his feet, pointed his head erect, and voiced a weird howl. It was not the cry of a dog, but a banshee shriek, a wailing of lost souls and tortured beings, and it filled the room like a solid substance. Descending on a low moan, it stopped. Pal lifted his lips and snarled fiercely. The two in the next cell gave way to hysterical laughter, and Pop busted from his desk. You'll have to keep that dog. He took a step backward as Pal snarled again. The mouth organ hidden in his hand. Jeff stood innocently. Pop stared. Why does he do that? I don't know. You'll have to keep him quiet. I'll try, Jeff promised. His blue eyes were dancing and his smile broadened. Some dogs were affected by sounds beyond those which normally came to their ears and Jeff had never decided whether they reacted because certain noises grated harshly on their ears, because some sounds reminded them of a battle or other experience, or if they were merely inclined to be in tune. Obviously, Pal was given to the latter sort of response. Waiting until Pop returned to his desk, 
Jeff blew the same note as softly. Pal responded with a whole chorus of shrieks that began on a tenor note and ascended to a high soprano. The echoes rolled back from the walls and seemed to bound forward again. It was almost an incredible thing that was promptly repeated when Jeff blew another note. Shut that dog up, Pop shrieked. I'm trying, Jeff said desperately. The door opened. Joe Parker came in. Jeff blew again very softly and Pal's immediate response filled the room. Their faces angry, Pop and the constable appeared in front of the cell and shouted to make themselves heard. Quiet! What'd you say? Jeff yelled. Quiet! Pal stopped howling, but he stopped so abruptly that the constable still shouted. If you can't make that dog be quiet, I'll take him out of here. Pal voiced a snarl that followed his howling, and both men stepped back. Joe Parker's hand dipped to his gun. You don't have to shout, Jeff soothed. I can hear you, and I wouldn't shoot either. The dog's mine. He can't possibly hurt you, and there are two witnesses who will prove it. Sure thing, Ike agreed happily. Bucky and me are your boys. Make him stop yelling, the constable said. People are standing on the street, wondering who's getting murdered down here. Send them down, Jeff invited. I represent Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, and I might sell. That dog has to stop yelling. Jeff shook a chiding finger at Pal. Stop yelling. Pop and the constable left. Ike and Bucky chuckled. Pal sat down, expectant eyes fixed on the hand that held Jeff's mouth the organ. He knew now where the sound originated, and he was ready the instant Jeff raised his hand. Pop and the constable, and their faces entreating, rather than commanding, came back. Can't you make him shut up? I told him. You heard me tell him. We can't have that noise. Why not? I jeered. Does it keep all the workers in the courthouse awake? Judge Carlson's trying to work, the constable said. He'll be working till nine tonight. Thought you said he'd gone fishing, Jeff accused Pop. That's Justice Murphy. He hears all the cases where no more than fifty dollars is involved. Don't make the judge mad, I chorted. What if he gets real upset? Can't you make him shut up? The constable pleaded. I'll try. The two went back to the desk. A match flared there, and an oil lamp cast a yellow glow into the corridor. Apparently night was approaching. The constable left, and Jeff pocketed the mouth organ. Five minutes later, he brought it out again, and once more a pal wrecked the silence. The door burst open, slammed shut, and Pop and the constable stood before Jeff's cell. Joe Parker spoke. How'd you like to get out, peddler? I don't know, Jeff said smoothly. I like it here. Now look, why can't you be reasonable? We haven't got much on you, and we're not mad at you. Everybody's going to be plumb out of their minds if that dog howls down here for a whole week. What's your proposition, Jeff said serenely. We'll leave you out, give you and that howling wolf pack ten minutes to get out of town and start looking for you. Jeff hesitated, scenting a trap and guessing that something besides Pal's howling was involved. Probably Pop had not been reticent about the new prisoner's willingness to consult attorneys. Jeff said finally, And if you catch me, you'll have me for breaking jail, too. The constable retorted grimly, We don't aim to hunt that hard. For a moment, Jeff pondered, as though considering everything seriously. His face was solemn when he looked up. Nope, he said, it's not enough. Ike looked pained. What do you want for getting out of jail? Pop owes me 39 cents for a hacksaw. I'll give the hacksaw back, Pop offered quickly. I don't want it. I want 39 cents. Oh, for Pete's sake. Pop took a purse from his pocket, counted out 39 cents, and passed it through the bars. Jeff pocketed the money. What's the next town? Stay right in the valley, seven miles down. You'll come to Delview. You can't miss. And heaven help Delview if they pick you up. Any other place? North through the mountains, there's Smithville. Better not try it. There's no direct road, and those mountains are plenty rugged. Good town, though, I called. That constable in Smithville... He minds his own business most of the time. So does most everybody else. It pays in Smithville. Wild place, huh? 
Not wild, I declared, just sensible. I'll go to Delview, Jeff decided. That's worse than Cressman, I snorted. They jail you there for looking cross-eyed. You got to go now, Joe pointed out. You took Pop's money. Open the cell. Bye, Jeff, I called. Me and Bucky may be seeing you. Take care of yourselves. Outside, instead of going to the main street, Jeff slipped behind the courthouse. Two more moving shadows in a place of shadows. He and Pal flittered past a cluster of lilacs and darted to a patch of trees. They threaded their way through the town, always alert and careful. Again, on the outskirts of Cressman, Jeff heaved a sign of relief and walked swiftly down the road. Once more, Pal had saved the day. Apparently, Pop and the constable had wanted only and wholeheartedly to be rid of them. Jeff felt a little saddened. The shiny name of Tarrant Enterprises, LTD, had become a little tarnished in Cressman. The concern had spent money and earned little enough. Jeff was startled by the gruff command. Wait there. He halted. A man stepped out of the shadows, looked closely at him, pointed a sawed-off shotgun at the ground, and said, Go ahead. Jeff thought of Ike and Bucky. Probably this man was one of the pickets waiting for them. He recovered his cheer. There were always fresh customers down the road, but they would not be where Jeff had told Joe Parker he intended to seek them. It would be no difficult matter to send a message to Delview and to ask the police there to be alert for a peddler, accompanied by a huge dog. At the first break in the mountains, Jeff left the road and started for the opportunities that must surely await him in Smithville. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas Chapter 4 of Trading Jeff and His Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Trading Jeff and His Dog by Jim Kilgard. Chapter 4 The Cabin. The rising sun turned the tops of the mountains to gold, and like slow-flowing water, sunshine crept gradually down the slopes. In a grove of pines, a chicory came out of the warm nest where he had spent the night. Three inches from his nest, the chicory paused on an outjutting stub. A hawk winged through the pines regularly, and though it had always missed by a comfortable margin, it had struck three times at the chicory. The pines were part of a marten's beat, and the marten had chased the chicory several times. In addition, on their way to one place or another, various other predators wandered through the pines, and a few of them were averse to eating chicory. The chicory held perfectly still, bright eyes glowing and small ears straining. Neither the hawk nor the marten were present and the chicory was puzzled, because he could see nothing else. Well, that should not be. Three big bucks were spending the season on this slope, and every night they bedded in the pines. This morning there was no sign of them. Though he could neither see nor hear anything, the chicory knew that something was present, if only because the deer were not. After five minutes, having assured himself that there was no immediate threat, the chicory set out to find whatever he had sensed. He scampered up the pine, leaped effortlessly into another, and took a different stand. Again he examined the grove. A smell of wood smoke tickled his nostrils, and the chicory knew that a man had come to the pines. That much discovered, he went into action. He leaped to another pine, raced swiftly up it, and made a leap so long that the twigs upon which he landed bent precariously. A master of aerial travel, the chicory paid no heed. Three minutes later, he found the man sleeping under a big pine. There was a huge dog beside him, and a bed of glowing coals so arranged that the heat they cast enveloped both man and dog. The chicory paused anger in his eyes he had squatter's rights in these pines and he lacked the remotest intention of sharing them with any man 
biting off a pine cone, the chicory dropped it squarely on the man's face. Jeff Tarrant came awake. There was no lingering struggle to achieve complete wakefulness, and no dropping back for another five minute slumber, because Jeff had long since learned that that must never be. He had to awaken instantly and at the least disturbance, because there was always a possibility that he might have to get up fighting, and he had a distinct impression that something had dropped on his face. Swift glances in all directions told him that there was nothing except Pal near, and Jeff relaxed. Now he could attend to the ceremony of awakening. Jeff rubbed his eyes, yawned, stretched, and rose. Rising with him, Pal saw the madly fleeing chicory. Following the dog's gaze, Jeff saw it too. Appalled by his own boldness, the chicory was putting distance between Jeff and himself as rapidly as possible. Jeff grinned. So, he doesn't want us around either, pal. Seems to me that lately nobody has wanted anything to do with Terran Enterprises Limited. Shame on them. Pal wagged his tail and made an enthusiastic attempt to lick his master's face. Jeff pushed him away. Pal's tongue was approximately the size of a dish towel and the consistency of sandpaper. Not to be defeated, Pal got in a good number of licks on his friend's hand, and Jeff chided, Cut it out! I can wash myself! As he walked to a little runlet that trickled through the pines and washed his face and hands, Jeff thought of last night. In the valley up which he had travelled, that runlet became a good-sized stream with several deep pools. Having fallen into two of them last night, Jeff had discovered the pools the hard way, but he had achieved his purpose. It was not only possible, but highly probable, that Joe Parker and Pop had ideas which they hadn't bothered to disclose when letting Jeff out of jail. If they were able to catch him again, he would be charged with jail-breaking, and that meant six months, and six months was plenty of time to steal the pack's contents. However, even if they followed him into the mountains, they couldn't catch him. A satisfying vision of the Delview police looking for him, and of Pop and the constable hopefully waiting, formed in Jeff's mind. He grinned happily, even though he was stranded in a wilderness with no customers in sight, and no telling when he would find any. Tarrant Enterprises Limited was in business again. Jeff took his watch out, saw that it had stopped, set it for nine o'clock, and wound it. He might be an hour, two hours, or three hours off. It made no difference. Tarrant Enterprises Limited guided its fortunes by the circumstances of the moment, and not by the dial of a watch or clock. Any hour of the twenty-four, or any minute of any hour, might present a precious and never-to-be-repeated opportunity. Therefore it was better to be alert for what the moment might present, than to depend too heavily on any timepiece. Last night he had been in too much of a hurry to think of eating, and when he had finally put what he considered an adequate distance between Cressman and himself, he had been too tired. And now he took the remainder of bread and cheese from his pack and divided both in half. Chow time, he said grandly. Here, pal, a wonderful breakfast. Pal gulped his portion. Jeff ate more slowly and when he had finished the last crumb he was completely serene. It mattered not at all that he was completely out of food, or that it was an unknown distance to the next place where he would be able to buy more. By all means, the future should be carefully weighed, but the future was a great and shining promise, and lack of food a small inconvenience. Let's go, he said happily. A little breeze sang to him, and the sun warmed him and he was completely cheerful as he resumed his journey. This was a new and fresh experience, and as such it was to be treasured. Pal ran a hundred feet ahead, slow to a walk, and further slow to a stalk, so deliberate that he moved at a snail's pace. He looked questioningly back at Jeff. Jeff wrinkled his brows. In town, or even near other people, Pal had not moved more than a yard away, here he would leave Jeff, and that was entirely understandable. 
and naturally he would feel freer in the wilderness but what did he want jeff halted what's up pal the dog stared hard at a copse of brush and for a moment jeff remained still and then he advanced slowly hope i'm not doing it wrong he murmured i know you're trying to tell me something but i'm too dumb to understand your language pal stayed perfectly rigid until jeff was within five feet and then went in to flush two grouse from the brush they winged thunderously up and drummed away and a great light dawned on jeff if pal had not had a former master he would not have been wearing a collar and obviously that master had lived partly by hunting sending the grouse pal had been asking jeff as plainly as a dog can ask anything whether or not he cared to shoot them jeff petted pal and heaped praise upon him good dog he exclaimed that's the boy pal sighed ecstatically because he had pleased his master he had already helped jeff out of two difficult situations and for that alone he deserved loyalty now it became evident that he would not be wholly dead weight jeff who had learned something about dogs reviewed what he knew there were various dogs for various purposes and thus the bull was for fighting the dachshund went into burrows and dragged out whatever sort of refuge there the setter hunted game birds the hound trailed etc occasionally there was an intelligent mongrel that combined the functions of two or more such specialists it was difficult to imagine pal crawling into burrows but he had already proven his ability to hunt birds would he do anything else it occurred to jeff that he knew little about his new partner and until now he had little chance to do any probing now there was every chance heel he ordered pal fell in beside him walking at his left and just far enough away so there was no danger of collision jeff was delighted he had already discovered that pal responded perfectly to other commands and must have had much training five minutes later there came an interruption buzzing angrily through the trees a bee made straight for jeff it danced up and down in front of his face seeking a place to light jeff swiped at it with his right hand and when he did pal bounded forward swift as a deer and as graceful he raced among the trees with seeming lack of effort he leaped high the better to see what lay about him finding nothing he looked back perplexedly come on jeff coaxed come on pal pal returned and jeff petted him fondly and now he knew something else about the dog a hand waved forward was pal's signal to look for game jeff stored the knowledge away pending the time it might be useful pal ranged ahead and on both sides jeff strode on the mountain had been steep but its summit was a broad plateau covered with pine forest and somewhere in the distant peaks that jeff could see must lie the town of smithville sooner or later he would get there and if he needed two or three days that was all right he was enjoying the hike and the farther away smithville was the farther he'd be from Cressman. he stopped to rest at a pond that fed a stream and saw trout in the clear waters removing his pack he opened the right compartment and took from it a fishing line and a box of hooks he tied a hook to the line cut a pole from a copse of willows growing beside the pond kicked a rock over and gathered up the fat worms beneath it baited and cast a dozen trout rushed the bait one got it and jeff landed him he continued to cast until he had nine trout jeff dressed them washed them took a grill and salt and pepper from the pack and cooked his fish pal cleaned up all the heads all the bones and four trout jeff ate the rest smacking his lips over them and entirely happy this he sighed is the way to live they descended into a valley and were crossing a field when a rabbit flushed in front of them white tail flashing it streaked through the grass jeff waved his right arm and pal raced forward so effortlessly that he almost seemed to float he overtook the fleeing rabbit and snatched it up the rabbit dangling from his jaws he trotted back and laid his game in jeff's hand 
Jeff laughed in sheer delight. Almost always he canvassed the back country, because that was the only place where usually he could be pretty sure of doing good business. But he had been so interested in his customers that he had had little time for the wilderness. Now there was an opportunity to see and observe, and he liked everything around him. He still wanted to wander, but if he ever did settle down, it would be in such a place. The two camped that night in another grove of pines, not knowing where they were, and not caring, and Jeff broiled the rabbit. It was stringy and tough, but hunger proved a powerful sauce, and when Jeff chewed and swallowed the last few shreds of meat, he felt as though he had partaken of princely fare. "'I wouldn't mind if this went on for a long while,' he told the contented pal. "'I like it almost as much as you do.' He arranged a fire to reflect against a fallen tree trunk, slept soundly all night, and awakened with the dawn. There was nothing for breakfast, but there had been nothing for a lot of breakfasts, and it made little difference. Sooner or later they would eat, and this morning it was sooner. No more than four hundred yards from their camp they reached a brawling little stream that raced frantically down slope. Again Jeff strung his tackle and caught trout. He laid them in the grill and was about to build a fire when Pal growled. It was a sound so soft that nothing more than a few feet away would have heard it. Jeff looked quickly at the dog and glanced around the forest. He saw nothing. Pal was on all fours, straining into the wind, and he growled again. Again Jeff found nothing. Leaving the pack and fish, Jeff stole to a big pine about thirty feet away and crouched behind it, he whispered, Down. Pal lay down, and Jeff continued to watch. Two minutes later, he saw a man coming through the forest. Very tall and very thin, the man was dressed in a sun-faded shirt from which half of the right sleeve was missing. Protruding from it, what could be seen of his right arm, had been scorched by so much sun that it was almost black. His left sleeve was tied at the wrist, as dilapidated as the shirt, his grey trousers ended six inches above scuffed shoes, and an expanse of naked leg showed that he wore no socks. A luxuriant beard covered his face, and curly black hair dangled over his ears and down the back of his head. In many parts of the country, Jeff had seen other men who might have been this one's twin. Obviously a hillbilly, he carried a carbine as though it were a part of him. He lingered behind a pine about fifty yards from Jeff's pack, and for a full minute he regarded it closely. Then, making no noise whatever, he approached and prodded the pack with his foot. As he looked curiously at the grill of trout, Jeff spoke. "'That's mine, stranger.' The man whirled, shouldered the carbine, and put it down again. Jeff rose. Bristling, his lips slightly lifted, Pal stayed very near. Pal knew what Jeff could not. The man was Bar Whitney, and presently he spoke. I won't go to touch it. I know that. Jeff had a customer. I can see that you're an honest man, but I thought I'd better make sure first. Right smart idea. Bar Whitney looked swiftly at Pal and glanced back at Jeff. His eyes revealed nothing, but he kept the carbine down. Expecting a flow of questions, Jeff was momentarily disconcerted when his visitor did not speak. Jeff glanced at the knife on his belt. With a six-inch blade, the point of the knife was thrust into a deerskin sheath, and there was a six-inch guard that protected the cutting edge. Sparkling keen, the blade probably was made out of an old file and fitted with an ingenious hilt of deer antler. Jeff watched the knife for only a split second. Home made. It was the work of an artist, and Jeff knew of lowlanders who would pay a good price for it. But he must not let the stranger know this. Bar Whitney remained silent, and Jeff said nothing. Often it was productive of the best results, to fit his own mood to that of a potential customer. Jeff flicked his pack open, took from it a clasp knife that was almost a small tool chest within itself, removed the trout from the grill, 
and arranged them on a slab of bark. He became absorbed in the grill. Opening the file on the clasp knife, he filed a sharp point from the grill's wire handle. He closed the file, opened the long pointed blade, and cut the fish's heads off. As he did so, he brushed the grill with his trousers, caught a loose thread which was always purposely loosened, and snipped it off with the scissors that the clasp knife also contained. Carefully, he worked with the awl blade, poking the cut thread back into place. Bar Whitney watched silently, and then said, Give me leave to look at it. Sure. Without looking at the other, Jeff gave him the knife. He started a fire, laid the trout back on the grill, and started cooking them. Jeff seasoned the fish and asked, Had breakfast? Yup. Jeff gave half the trout to Pal and gravely stripped the flesh from his own share. He gave Pal the stripped bones, went down to the stream, dug a handful of sand from it, and scrubbed the grill clean. Bar Whitney was still opening and closing the blade, scissors, awl, screwdriver, file, and fork that folded into the clasp knife stag handle. He spoke. Good knife. Yeah. Jeff agreed. How much? Six dollars. Silence followed. Jeff, who had guessed that Bar Whitney was as likely to have six thousand as six dollars, made up his pack. The other spoke again. You swap? Maybe. For what? Your rifle? The other jumped as though stung. Jeff, who knew that it's as easy to trade a hillbilly out of his hand as to separate him from his rifle, continued to work calmly. The pack, never cumbersome, could be made so when he wanted to gain time. Bar Whitney asked, Trade knives? Let's see yours. Stripping the knife from his belt, Bar handed it to Jeff. Betraying nothing of what he thought, Jeff unsheathed the homemade weapon. Razor sharp, it was exquisitely balanced, and so finely made, that blade of steel and hilt of horn flowed into each other as smoothly and as naturally as two placid creeks mingle their waters. Ordinarily, Jeff was able to do little in towns and cities, but he could, if he had merchandise like this to offer. Aside from being highly practical, the knife was a collector's item. Jeff handed it back. Guess not. What do you want? Two knives like that. Smirking faintly, Bar Whitney thrust a hand inside his shirt and brought out the twin to the first knife. Obviously, he'd been wearing it in a shoulder sheath. He dropped both knives beside Jeff, and for the first time there was a change in his expression. His eyes were gleeful, as though he'd been too sharp for the peddler, and he clutched the clasp knife firmly. Jeff said in pretended disappointment, Guess I talked myself out of that one. Yes, you did. Well, I do sometimes. Which way is it to Smithville? Bar Whitney pointed down a valley. Thar. How far? A piece. Without further comment, Bar Whitney turned and strode into the forest. Jeff shouldered his pack and looked at Pal. The dog stood erect, still faintly bristled as he looked after the departing man, and Jeff wondered why. He shrugged. Some people just naturally roused the dog to anger, and it was not important. Jeff started toward Smithville. Ike had spoken highly of Smithville, and in Ike's eyes its virtue lay in the fact that people there minded their own business. What Jeff had seen bore that out. Hillbillies were independent not at all inclined to meddle in the affairs of others or to having their own investigated. Scornful of any one who wore an officer's badge, they were quick to take violent action if what they considered their personal rights were violated. But usually they did not bother those who let them alone. Jeff strolled in the direction Bar Whitney had indicated. Somewhere ahead lay Smithville, and Bar Whitney had given him a completely new idea. This could not be a wealthy land if the man Jeff had met was any indication of its riches. 
shut off from the world and with little money the hill people must of necessity do for themselves and few of them were satisfied to have everything slipshod it naturally followed that they would have brought handicraft to a high perfection jeff planned as he walked seldom had jeff even tried to pedal in any town larger than cressman in big cities he could do no business at all but not all of the people in cities were contented with the monotonous sameness of the stamped and stereotyped products available to them they had lost the art of handicraft themselves but some still appreciated it and were able to pay for it on the other hand there was an excellent chance that the inhabitants of these mountains lacking the money to buy city goods would be eager to trade for them jeff began to whistle pal he said happily maybe just maybe tarrant enterprises limited is about to become an even bigger business pal was padding ahead glancing from side to side and making eager little excursions into the brush and forest this was his country times without number he had walked through these same woods with johnny blazer returning excited him he went from a boulder to a patch of brush and from there to a stump his tail wagged constantly as once again he saw all the old landmarks that were so familiar and so dear not understanding jeff wondered they came to a footpath jeff followed pal down the path not knowing where it led but sure that it would take them somewhere if it didn't bring them to smithville it would certainly lead them to some house whose inhabitants could tell him exactly how to get there and jeff was in no hurry he was naturally footloose and the woods were free jeff knew a mounting disinclination to go to smithville at once it would suit him better to camp in the open again tonight the path joined a road there were wagon tracks hoof prints and even tire tracks left by venturesome drivers of automobiles jeff came to a sure sign of the latter a blown tire lying beside the road and shook a sympathetic head he did not share the views of those who proclaim cars a passing fad they would be the conveyance of the future if only because they could travel as far in one hour as a horse could in three their many faults were sure to be corrected pal frolicked like a puppy ears shaking and tail wagging as he bounced around with a wide canine grin on his mouth when he came to another dim footpath leading out of the woods he halted to look inquiringly back at his master hesitantly he had not yet had any assurance that jeff wanted to visit it he looked longingly toward johnny blazer's cabin wondering what pal wanted now jeff halted beside him the cabin was hidden by trees and from this distance no part of it could be seen and then a puff of wood smoke drifted to jeff's nostrils and the cabin betrayed itself with pal dancing eagerly ahead he started up the path fifty yards from the road he came to johnny blazer's cabin and halted uncertainly the place looked abandoned of the two windows he could see a pane of glass was missing from each still smoke drifted from the chimney obviously someone was living in the cabin jeff knocked on the door nobody answered he knocked again and when there was no response he walked in a homemade chair with one broken leg lay upended on the floor there were a few broken dishes a stove scattered papers and dust wind blew through empty panes where glass had been about to go farther in for a closer inspection jeff was halted by a near hysterical command all right mister raise both hands and raise em high certainly jeff agreed pleasantly anything to oblige jeff raised both hands and heard turn around he turned to confront the yawning muzzles of a double-barreled eight-gauge shotgun holding it and dwarfed by it but never flinching was a blazing-eyed boy who could not possibly be more than ten years old End of chapter four